There's other requests that were not made, O oh God. Come, help us. Help us in our study, Lord Jesus, that we might see the truth, love the truth, find our hearts um, drawn to the living God. Uh, and no matter what uh, our circumstances, we would trust you and find the peace that surpasses all understanding. Be with us through this virtual situation and all the electronics and all that's involved so that we might be able to rejoice in this Bible study. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right. All right. We are in Psalm 41. And since it is a shorter psalm, I like to read the psalm. I like to read them all, but sometimes uh, it, it, uh, uh, it's such a long psalm, it's it best to do it in chunks. So here, Psalm 41, for the choir director, a psalm of David. How blessed is he who considers the helpless. The Lord will deliver him in a day of trouble. The Lord will protect him and keep him alive, and he shall be called blessed upon the earth. And do not give him over to the desires of his enemies. The Lord will sustain him upon his sickbed in his illness. You restore him to health. As for me, I said, O oh Lord, be gracious to me. Heal my soul, for I have sinned against you. My enemies speak evil against me. When will he die and his name perish? And when he comes to see me, he speaks falsehood. His heart gathers wickedness to itself. When he goes outside, he tells it. All who hate me whisper together against me. Against me, they devise my hurt, saying, a wicked thing is poured out upon him that when he lies down, he will not rise up again. Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. But you, O Lord, be gracious to me and uh, raise me up that I may repay them. By this I know that you are pleased with me because my enemy does not shout in triumph over me. As for me, you uphold me in my integrity and you set me in your presence forever. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting Amen and amen. Well, let's see. Well, Psalm 41 is sometimes classified as a praise psalm with an imprecatory section in verses 4 through 10. Now you say, well, I remember that word imprecatory, but what is it? It's a cursing kind of section. Well, the psalm is also considered to be a lament, but it doesn't follow the typical pattern of a lament psalm. So it's kind of a psalm that's hard to classify. The intervention of the Lord is as guilt for sin and illness has fallen upon him. And what is added to the circumstances is that people visit him with pleasantries. Remember, he's the king, but deal treacherously in uh, hopes to destroy him. So they come with a certain face, but in motives that are different. The superscription indicates that this is a psalm of David. And I see most commentators date the psalm later, but there's no compelling evidence to do this. Uh, there are five books in the Psalter we call the Psalms. 
And Psalm 41 is the last psalm in book one. One more point. Uh, verse 13 is not officially a part of the psalm, but it is a doxology at the end of the first book of the psalm. And so they always want to end with praise. This is how I would um, divide the psalm into three sections. Instruction in verses 1 through 3, uh, testimony in 4 through 10, and thanksgiving in 11 and 12, and a doxology in verse 13. But I just threw 13 in to the last section because it's really not officially a part of the psalm. And um, this is um, uh, an interesting psalm, uh, to say the least. I, I, I learned uh, God brought to mind some things that I didn't read in the commentary, which is always exciting for me, as God would be pleased to lead me to things, hopefully, that are edifying and part of the truth of his, of his word. And also, brothers, um, one of the most difficult times in life is when you're, when a friend, may I say, according to this one, a close friend betrays you. How, how are you going to respond? If I was speaking at school with those who want to go into the ministry, I would, I would stop at this time and would have to say to them, this is a possibility. And it is in these kinds of situations that sometimes people bail out of the ministry. It is uh, very hurtful. The consequences are hurtful too because if, if a, a close friend in the ministry betrays you, then there's a tendency for us to say, I'll, ne let, I'll never let anybody get that close again. And if that's the case, then you can't truly minister to people. So it is always going to be a danger in the ministry and that you would be uh, able, what shall I say, to forgive, to move on, still uh, not guard your heart to the extent that you don't let anybody in. Because if you don't let people in, then you can't truly disciple those inner circle people because they never seem to reach you. You always seem to be distant. So you need to tuck Psalm 41 into your, uh, into your heart. Well, let's begin with this psalm. And the psalm deals with instruction. The Lord delivers and helps those who help people in their time of need. And in verse 1, you see the action he, and what we should uh, also uh, have within our lives. He has regard for the helpless. Uh, this person can't help himself or herself in this situation. And so... Uh, you come along, you sacrifice your time mentally, emotionally, and physically to help this person. And, uh, this, and God is saying, if you will do that in the power of the Spirit, I will bless you. Isn't that a great? Now, we're not looking for necessarily uh, physical blessings of money or whatever, but just the spiritual blessing of what God wants to do. How blessed is he who considers the helpless, the Lord will deliver him in the day of trouble. When they are in their trouble and you help them, God says, hey, I'll come alongside you in your trouble. And so the reward of helping somebody in their trouble is that the Lord will come and help you in, his, in your trouble. Sure, now we need to be careful here. Sometimes we want the Lord to uh, help me in the way I want him to help me. 
And God says, well, I, I will help you in the way that is the best for you in this situation. The results of the deliverance is found in verses 2 and 3. He says there that he would protect in the uh, he will keep, uh, Lord keeps him alive. So in this situation, it has to deal with your very life could be in danger. And then he said, just in a, uh, I will bless him. Uh, in my text, it says um, upon the earth, in the earth or in the land. That phrase in the land is very important because when the Jewish people are in the land, it is demonstration of God's blessing. God says, if you don't obey me, guess what? Kick you out of the land. So he would be blessed and he'd be kept in the land. That word blessed is also used in verse 1, isn't it? Uh, uh, blessed in verse 1 and blessed in verse 2. And he will del uh, delivered from his enemies in the latter part of verse 2. And then in verse 3, he sustains and restores him in his sickness. Now, um, we need to be careful with these kinds of verses that we don't misunderstand them. And this is where biblical theology of the Old Testament comes into play. If we had time, which we don't, <laughs> it, it, you go back and read Deuteronomy 28. Now, when I, when I teach the prophets at school, I, the first uh, lecture, I, I make the students literally read Deuteronomy 28. It's quite a long chapter because it deals with it, it, uh, God saying to them, if you will obey me, if you disobey me, this is what's going to happen. And it is bad. But he says, now if you obey me, then this is what's going to happen. And this is what I promise. I will give your land. Your land will be prosperous. I'll give you riches. I will give this, that, and the other. That was part of the Mosaic Law Covenant. And then I stopped in my, uh, to my students and I say, are you under the Mosaic Law Covenant? And they go, N most of them, no. Good, you know. So that's not a direct promise to me, is it? Well, I guess not. No, that's not. <laughs> You're not. And then we go to uh, Galatians 6, 6 and, and 7. It deals with the, the blessings of sowing to the flesh or reaping things uh, in the spirit that are kind of like this, but not exact. So the nation of Israel if they would obey God in the land and do these things, sickness would not come, prosperity would come, uh, but when they are disobedience, and then sickness will come, the, the crops won't come, and if they don't, I'll kick you out of the land, which he did because of their disobedience in the Babylonian captivity. So careful with these kinds of verses. I hope that helps you to give you some understanding in that. Now, from that instruction and blessing, he starts in verses 4 through 10 in the uh, uh, precatory, in precatory section. Those who the Lord preserves and protects will encourage others to pray in the situation. The imprecatory second section is toward the end. Verses four, verse 4 is be gracious. Uh, you can see this again. Uh, in verse 10, when he will talk about, be uh, you, O Lord, be gracious to me. So uh, he's asking for the grace of God in his life. And then he says uh, to, uh, in verse 4, uh, heal my soul, for I have sinned against you. So part of his problem and part of the situation, again, is that uh, David... Uh, we don't know what sin it is or what part of it is, but because of his sin, there are certain things that he begins to experience and part of it's in his own personal life, physically. And so, heal my soul, for I have sinned against you. 
And then uh, in verse uh, 5, and just, I'll get into he, 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 5 through 9, he's going to give some details of his suffering. But one of the reasons why, in verse uh, uh, 4, heal my soul, for I have sinned against you. So uh, he wants to do something about it. And I put down there, it's not in your notes, but I, you know, when I go through my notes again, I always add something. And um, in 2 Corinthians, you ask yourself sometimes, well then, Lord, why do I have to go through some of these kinds of things? Well, turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. When I have a a psalm that's only 13 verses, I get to add a little bit here from the New Testament. Verses 3 and 4. This is one of the interesting sections. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. In other words, that verse is saying some of the reasons why you go through some difficulties and ask God that he would comfort you is that so that when you go, when, <laughs> when somebody else goes through it, you have experienced it and also the comfort for which God is uh, given you and you can be the instrument, the conduit by which God can comfort other people through you. So sometimes you say, well, why does this happen to me? And how, you know, and then you seek God's comfort and you find that comfort. Well, maybe that was the only reason why that you may gain that experience and gain that comfort in the midst of that difficulty so that you might be able to help others to come to the comfort for which you have experienced in those situations. Well, um, David is able to do that in this situation. So from this testimony, we come to what we would call the lament, the details of his suffering from his enemies and from his trusted friend. So painful. His enemies in verse 5, my enemies speak evil against me. And his, uh, his enemies, what, what do they do? They will, uh, they will be, uh, when, he will, when he will die and his name perishes. So, they desire his death and that his name be forgotten. In other words, they want to dig up his tombstone and throw it into the sea and let the grass grow over his grave and that no one will know the identity of whoever's buried there because they won't even know anybody's buried there. They want not just that he die, but his whole namesake and all his influence and everything would be wiped clean from the earth. Well, that's pretty heavy. They desire his death and that his name would be forgotten. His enemies, in uh, verse 6, uh, lie, their heart is wicked, they gather evil to spread it. Now remember, um, if it was just David's enemies, you can say, well, you know, He's in a high position as king, and this is what. But this is also not just his enemies, but his friend who's become his enemy. And now he sees the lies, the evil that is being spread in verse 6. The latter part of verse 6 his heart gathers wickedness to itself. When he goes outside, he tells it. He spreads the evil to other people. It's not that he just comes and does it and schemes evil. He he spreads it when he leaves. 
verse 7. Uh, they desire his demise. And all who hate me whisper together against me. <laughs> against me, they devise my hurt. Saying, and here's verse 8. <clears throat> this is what they desire. That his sickbed become his deathbed. Again, <clears throat> the wicked thing is poured out upon him that when he lies down, he will not rise again. He, he lies down because of his sickness. Oh, that he dies there. Now, if this was just his enemies, again, I'm stressing this because the psalm will stress it. He would understand, well, okay, that's your enemy. But this is going to be also a friend. And this is where we come to verse 9. Even my close friend, in whom I trusted, he's his confidant, who, are, who ate my bread. We, we had intimate fellowship with each other. Has lifted up his heel against me. The, the literal from the Hebrew text about this man, it says uh, in the text he was a close friend. And the Hebrew text literally says, a man of my peace, the man of my shalom. My, you remember the word shalom is not just peace, but welfare, taking care of him. He was thought to be a man committed to David's peace. Uh, the all-around welfare of David, and he betrays him. Uh, he was a close friend who cared, and he trusted him, and now he's become his enemy. You can, you can uh, start thinking through and <laughs> How devastating that is to have all kinds of other enemies. You know, you understand they're your enemies, but the one who you ministered with and ministered to you and fellowship with you and did things with you and now uh, intentionally wants you to die. That is heavy. Uh, the fellowship with each other in eating a meal together. Excuse Literally. You. Yes. Um, you may go over this, but um, that's kind of the Judas Jesus scenario. Yeah, we're going to look at it. Matter of fact, uh, John uh, in the Gospels, uh, chapter 13, will, will actually quote this passage. And we will look at it, Corey. Great. You picked it up correctly, brother. Excellent. So um, it says here, it, he lifted up his heel against me. Literally from the Hebrew text, he has made great his heel against me. <laughs> he, he, uh, in, in, I guess in martial arts, he, he placed his heel right in my soda plex and, and kicked me. Uh, kicked me right there in the soda plex and, and knocked me to the ground and knocked the breath out of me. I think I'm dying. Because of that. The term of treachery is key to understanding the Old Testament background here. When he speaks about the heel, uh, we have to go back to Jacob, right? When Jacob and Esau as twins were born, uh, uh, Esau comes out first, but Jacob has his hand on Esau's what? Heel, right? He's grabbing his heel. Uh, and, uh, and so they said, oh, because he did that, his name will be Jacob. Now, we often say, well, he's a heel grabber, so he's a deceiver. Well, the term itself does not necessarily mean in a negative. It means he may be protected or the Lord protects. And yet, here this concept has a 
positive contact. Why would a mother uh, name uh, his, uh, their, their child Jacob? Because God didn't say to do that. It, it, it's a negative term. It just becomes a negative. A grabber of the heel does not necessarily have to be a deceiver. It could be a protector. But what we find out as Jacob's life continues, that this deception caused his name to turn to a negative concept instead of a positive concept, that the heel grabber was one who would be a deceiver. Now, in Genesis chapter 27, now Genesis 25, we, we see the story and the birth of Jacob as the heel grabber. <clears throat> but in chapter 27, we see that uh, the, the, uh, the statement of, of him turning to, uh, this concept turning to a negative. <clears throat> Notice uh, when Esau says, then he said, <clears throat> is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times. He looked, he took away my birthright with some stew, right? Uh, of course, he's not, uh, uh, Esau's not lily white in this situation. But anyway, he took his birthright and behold, now he's taking away my blessing. You remember Jacob came in and uh, dressed up like Esau and, and snuck in to get the, the blessing of his father. And so that was definitely a supplanting. Even though God said he's going to get it, he, he should have trusted God with it. So the birthright and the blessings. And he said, have you not reserved a blessing for me, father? So we see then that concept of now the heel grabber is now a deceptive term that's being used. Matter of fact, we don't have to turn to, but Jeremiah 9 verse 4 uses the same Hebrew word and puts two Hebrew words in different uh, syntactical usages to put together dealing with deception in this. So we see here then that the concept uh, of a heel um, grabber or he lifting up his heel is a now a negative term, a term of deception. <laughs> and so uh, now what we find here is that John uses with our Lord um, this text in uh, Psalm 41 verse 9 uh, in Jesus' life. So now let's turn to the Gospel of John and place you in the section of chapter 13. Now, why are we going here? Is because Psalm 41 9 is used in John 13, verse 18. Yeah. You've got, this is the time when Jesus meets in the upper room and, and everybody and his disciples uh, didn't want, nobody wanted to take the towel and the, and the dish to wash uh, each other's feet and Jesus begins to wash their feet. Uh, uh, and of course, being the one who would forgive, <clears throat> the washing of the feet is forgiveness and uh, uh, a servant heart uh, because he speaks about forgiveness and uh, in verse uh, in verses six and following when G when Peter says well you know Lord don't wash my feet well if I don't wash your feet you can't anything you can't anything do with me he said well then give me a bath he said well no no you've already had a bath in other words you already saved Peter you just need daily to have your feet washed with the sins in the situation. So sin is involved here in washing feet, but also servanthood. Will you serve and will you forgive? I will tell you this. If you don't forgive, you will not serve. And then... Uh, at the ends of uh, this section of 
1 through 20 of John 13, beginning with verse 17. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. And then he says, I do not speak of all of you. I know the ones I have chosen, but it is that the scriptures might be fulfilled. And now he quotes Psalm 41, 9. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. So, you say to me, which I said to myself many years ago, how can uh, Jesus and John record uh, from Psalm 41, 9 when it's speaking of David and not of Jesus? Well, you, get, you need to get used to this because uh, the, the New Testament scriptures use the Old Testament scriptures in many ways. It's not, sim, very, it's not simplistic at all. They use it in all kinds of ways. And because David being the king and uh, uh, picturing the, the Messiah to come in many ways, not always, he is often easily used as a type, a picture. A word type is a picture of. And so here is King David when the king will come and he uses this uh, psalm uh, because it is in some way a messianic type of psalm because David is uh, the king and can be used as a picture. Jesus is king. And so therefore, the, the use of those terms together are often used. This is not the only time this is doing this. It's used an unbelievable amount of times in the Psalms this way. Uh, Peter in Acts chapter 2 will talk about the resurrection and he'll quote Psalm 16, dealing with again another messianic Psalm of David. So uh, we, we see that the, uh, the picture of, of David being the, the type of Messiah, which he would come, uh, would also to a high degree be used for Jesus Christ, and he takes it. Okay? Now, there's something else that's here. And uh, the Lord brought it to mind, and I... Uh, I raised my hands and worshiped. And when my wife came down, I said, oh, honey, I'm so glad you came down because the Lord has just revealed something to me that I, uh, uh, I'm sure others may have already seen it, but I didn't read it. It's just God brought it to mind. When is it the first time that we have the concept of a heel used in Scripture? Well, you'll have to go back way back. Uh, it's found in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And it has to do with the gospel. Matter of fact, we, in, uh, as theologians and exegetes call Genesis 3, 15, the pro-evangelion, the first proclamation of the gospel. Now, if you didn't have the rest of the Bible, you have not figured out this because it's in riddle, I call it riddle form. It's, it's not plainly stated unless you know the rest of the story and how the Old Testament into the New Testament reveals that. Matter of fact, we don't know exactly stated that the, serp, the, the serpent in the garden was used by the devil until Revelation 12. That's specifically stated. Now, I think we could still use it if we didn't have that, but it specifically mentions it. But in Genesis 3, verse 15, remember that phrase, and you will bruise him on the heel. Now let's go through this verse to demonstrate that now the heel is becoming part of a messianic uh, piece of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. So let's look at this. I even put some slides up for you because it's a, a little confusing. Let's read Genesis 3, verse 15. 
I will put enmity between you and the woman. Now remember the context. You now is Satan who used the serpent in bringing the first uh, bringing out the first sin of mankind. So the you is the serpent and the woman, of course, is Eve. So I'll put enmity uh, between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. I will put enmity between. There's going to be some problems because sin comes into the world. Then he says in the next phrase, and you will bruise him on, oh, excuse me. He shall, uh, he shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. So, so um, dealing with your seed and her seeds, um, let's see, make sure I got the right slide here. Yep. Um, your seed and her seed. Your seed would be the evil one, Satan's seed. And her seed would be the, the, considered to be the believer's seeds that would flow from these two representatives. The representative of the unbelieving seed would be Satan. He's a father of lies. And so he therefore has many people of unbelieving in that who don't come. To Christ. Those who come to Christ, we have our representative is Jesus Christ who is believer. So when he says here it, between your seed and her seed, he speaks of representatives. And then finally, it says in Genesis 3 15, and you shall bruise him, oh, excuse me, he shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. Um, he, if you notice I put red for Jesus, he, the Lord, will crush the head. That's a mortal wound, isn't it? It is fatal. He takes care of the evil one in sin. So Jesus Christ's death on the cross defeats Satan. He crushes his head. But Satan, you, Satan, will crush uh, the heel. Uh, in other words, Satan's blow to Christ was this crucifixion, but it only lasts till the resurrection. And so a crushing of the heel is not a fatal wound, but it is involved with Satan crushing the heel. And he also now uses the heel uh, <clears throat> In uh, John chapter 13, verse 28, about someone who would, um, well, of course, we know who it is, uh, who would betray Jesus, Judas, and he is part of the heel of the crushing that is involved in the theology there. So, man, did I bring in a can of worms, didn't I? But I think the scripture brings it forth. The first mention of the heel is in Genesis 3.15, the crushing of the heel. And now uh, in Psalm 41, it talks about uh, uh, someone who was a close friend of David who would uh, um, go against him. And he uses, he lifted up his heel against him. And then we come to the New Testament in John chapter 13, 38, that uses uh, Psalm 41, <clears throat> verse 9, as an indication of Judas who would betray. So we have a betrayal in 41, verse 9, to David. We now have a betrayal in John chapter 13 using Psalm 41, verse 9, which comes back to the theology of, of Genesis 3.15. I hope you've followed me on that. It's thrilling to see the scripture being put together in these things. Well, I better hurry through, hadn't I? Well, in verse 10, back in Psalm 41, we move to a prayer of restoration to right the wrong. 
but you, O Lord, be gracious to me and raise me up that I may repay them, that he might be able uh, to take care of these, this injustice that happens to him. Uh, I, and then in beginning in verse 11 and following is a thanksgiving section uh, offered for rescuing him, upholding his integrity and securing his presence with the Lord. Verse 11, but this I know that you are pleased with me because my enemy does not shout in triumph over me. And so he gives a declaration. The benefits, he says in verse 12, as for me, you uphold my integrity. Now, you might say to yourself, well, how can you say that his integrity was upheld when he's already told me in the psalm he sinned? And part of the reason he's receiving all this is because of his sin. Well, being a sinner does not mean we lose our integrity with the Lord if we repent and rely on his mercy. Right? Uh, our in, how do you build integrity? Uh, as a general rule, it's not lost in one uh, uh, particular sin unless that one particular sin has continued and continued and continued and continued and continued and therefore it's lost. But you can lose uh, your integrity, but how do you build it? Well, you have to build it through consistency. Well, it's pursuing the Lord through the scriptures and doing it consistently. The only way we can consistently live out the scriptures is through the Holy Spirit and repenting when we sin and humility and reliance on his mercy and we could go on. So... Uh, our integrity is not lost if we repent as a general rule. Are there certain sins that could in one thing, uh, uh, one time cause the whole building to collapse? Yeah. But as a general rule, we don't lose our integrity because we sin if we repent and we are more consistent because we're all sinners, right? I mean, if we lose our integrity because we sin once, we're through. I mean, we, we, that's it. But if, if, if we find that our, our integrity is that the characteristic of our life is that when we sin, we immediately take care of it. This is what he says, the benefit of the Lord upholding his integrity. And you set me in your presence forever. Now, uh, I have some people that think that uh, the, the Old Testament doesn't talk about eternity much. Well, I'm seeing throughout the Psalms, it's all over the place. And you can remember, I'm always pointing them out here. So the benefits of his, his life, it, uh, ultimately in the end, what, what gets him, th you, you ready? You say, well, well, Steve, how do you get through your, one of your best friends, um, turning and become a Judas and betraying you. Well, ultimately is that you are concentrated on the eternal aspect that one day I will be in your presence where this doesn't happen. So are you living for just now? Are you allow that unbelievable devastation, which could ruin you? It, it is something that could ruin you. It is that traumatic, but the reason why you don't is that you're not living for this present. It's not living just before my friends. I'm living for eternity, that the eternal part is present. I'm finding more and more passages that if you want to be effective and not be devastated and live godly in this life, then you have to have a constant reminder that this life's short. I may die today. I may die tomorrow. I may die the next hour. Now, I'm going to be in the presence of the Lord and think about eternity. And that keeps you in the situation. Because he says, and you will set me in your presence forever. 
I may have to experience this Judas betrayal. But one day, I'll be in your presence. And that was what kept him. Or part of the things that would keep him. Now, verse 13, as I told you, is really not part of the psalm. Um, it is a ending of the book of the psalm, and they always want to end it with an upbeat. So, blessed, that is your doxology, blessed be the God of Israel, and then he speaks about an attribute of God of eternity. eternity. We call it eternity past, eternity future, because we live in this present time. But he says, from everlasting to everlasting. That's a classic of uh, Moses' psalm in Psalm 90. From everlasting from this way and everlasting that direction. And then he has to say, amen, amen, right? And so uh, it is biblical to say amen. <laughs> well, what, how could I say, how could I summarize this psalm in one sentence. Uh, I do this as a discipline, and um, but sometimes it's helpful. I hope it's helpful to you today. The Lord delivers, preserves, and protects those who help others and who encourage the saints to pray when a close friend betrays them so that they can give thanks for the Lord's deliverance and security of eternal life. An application maybe of a psalm, one of many, the Lord delights in those who show mercy to people in need and he will deliver them in their time of trouble according to his way and timing to remind them that the Lord has set them in his presence forever. Whew, what a psalm. I was at times left breathless as I studied this particular psalm. Well, let me pray and then we can have our personal comments. So stay with us. Lord, thank you for this psalm. Thank you for allowing David to go through a betrayal. I know it wasn't pleasant for him, but it isn't pleasant for us. But we need to know how to handle it, Lord. And you went through the betrayal of all betrayals through Judas. And you taught us how. Help us, Lord Jesus, to make sure we're not living here because when somebody betrays us, the tendency is I'll never forget it and I will, I will chalk it up against that person for the rest of their life until I'm, I'm gone. And that will destroy us. Help us, Lord, in those times to remember the everlasting to everlasting God who will set us in His presence forever that you would heal our hearts so we will be able to minister again for your glory. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.